And you can have your Bibles in front of you and have them open to Philippians chapter 4. And our focus today will be on Philippians chapter 4, verse 10 through 13. Our, we are in the fifth week of a 10-week series on renewing the mind so that we begin to think the way God wants us to think, so that we begin to live the way God wants us to live. And our subject this morning is contentment. Uh, we, everybody wants to be content, but we don't want to be accused of being content. For instance, if you're a ball player, you don't want your coach saying about you, well, he's content with his game. Well, just think about that, you know. It's like he doesn't have any more ambition. He just is satisfied with where he's at. Or maybe you're an employee. You don't want your boss saying to somebody else, well, he's content with what he's doing. You know, you know, no more walking the ladder, no more climbing the ladder, no more getting to the top. Where's the ambition? We, we want to be content, but we don't want anybody saying that we're content. I think part of the problem is that uh, the type of contentment the world talks about is a little different than the contentment that the Bible talks about. And we're going to explore that this morning in the sermon. Now, the book of Philippians is written by the Apostle Paul to a church in Philippi, which is located in an area called Macedonia. It's a church that Paul had planted, and it was a, it's a very upbeat letter, and it's written to the church because this particular church is one of the few churches that gave Paul revenue so he could go out and do his missionary journeys and spread the gospel in areas where the gospel had never gone. So the book of Philippians is a rather upbeat and it's a thank you letter to this particular church. But I want you to understand something about the letter. Paul was writing this letter while, uh, while he was in jail in Rome. He was a prisoner, but he wasn't in a dungeon. He was under house arrest. Now, if you were in house arrest, that meant that you had to pay for that rented quarters. It meant that if you didn't pay, you were put in a dungeon. You could never leave the house. You could receive some visitors if they could find you. You were chained to a Roman guard 24 hours a day for the entire length that you were in this rented home. Paul was not a free man. Now, as we talk about contentment, I want you to remember where Paul was. He's in jail. He's not free, and he's under some significant duress. Listen to verses 10 through 13 again. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last you have received or revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lacked opportunity. I'm going to stop there and let you know what's happened. The church of Philippi was constantly sending Paul financial gifts so he could do his ministry. Paul then got thrown into prison in another area. He spent two years in that particular prison, but the church of Philippi couldn't find him, so they couldn't send him any money. You have to remember that the method of communication back then is a little different than the method of communication now. If somebody wanted to find somebody, they would say, where do you think Paul is? I don't know. Well, we guess we ought to find him. Yeah. Well, let's just spread the word. And maybe two or three years later, you might get a message. Wait, we found him. He used to be in Caesarea in prison, but he left, and we have no idea where he is now. Well, they had gotten that message. They couldn't find him, and now they found out that he's in Rome. So they gathered their resources, and they sent him money, and Paul was so thankful for that money because now he could pay his rent for the house that he was under house arrest in. So we pick up the story. Verse 11. Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means. I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need, 
I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Now, if you like taking notes, you like scribbling on your outline, you ought to underline the word learn. It appears two times in the text. He learned to be content. He learned the secret of contentment. Something you need to know about that word learned in the Greek. I seldom give you Greek lessons, but here's one. It's written in the aorist tense. And that means that whatever is in the aorist tense, it took place at a point in time. Just right then. It's like an aha moment. It's a like, uh, I get it. It just, the light goes on. I don't know if that's ever happened to you. Somebody's explaining something to you. You're not getting, you're not getting, all of a sudden the light goes on. That would be a moment of time. Well, Paul has learned about contentment. It was something he learned at a moment in time, and it was his forever. Now you sit back and say, well, what's contentment? I don't care when it's learned, how it's learned, how long it takes to get it. What's contentment? Well, before we look at what contentment is, let's take a look at what contentment isn't. Sometimes you got to bulldoze and clear a plot before you can build on it, so that's what we're going to do. Biblical contentment is not happiness. The Apostle Paul never said in the book of Philippians, I am so happy to be in prison in Rome. He never said that. He didn't say, I am so happy I'm chained to this prison guard 24 hours a day. He never said that. Yet he was content. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 to 10, and you don't have to turn to it, there's a story where the Apostle Paul talks about a thorn that he has in the flesh. We don't know what that thorn was, whether it was a physical ailment or, or something else, but it really hindered him from what he thought was doing his ministry. And so he spent three seasons of prayer, which means he prayed and fasted for a period of time, begging God to remove this thorn that was in his flesh. And God said three times, no. Now, here's the point. You don't plead with God to change something if you enjoy it. You don't ask God to change something if you're happy with it. Paul was not happy with his thorn in the flesh, yet he was very content. Another situation, we look at Matthew chapter 26, and you can read this on your own, but remember, uh, Jesus is going to go to the cross, and he comes to the night before he's crucified, and He's going to Gethsemane to pray. Listen to what he says. Then Jesus came to them to a place called Gethsemane and said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be grieved and distressed. And then he said to them, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch with me. And he went a little beyond them and fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Now, gang, there is no happiness here. Jesus is grieved to the point where he feels that he's going to die because of this grief. But if there's anybody in the Bible that is the epitome of contentment, it would be Jesus Christ. Neither Paul nor Jesus were happy in these passages we just read. The point is, you can be content and still hate the situation that you're in. Number two, contentment is not the lack of ambition. In Philippians chapter 3, verses 10 to 15, the Apostle Paul is talking about his desire to be like Christ so that he can become more and more like Christ so that he can obtain this reward that Christ has for him. Listen to what he says. He says, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and the, and the participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, 
And so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead, not that I've already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that which Christ took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Now, Paul had great ambition to become more and more like Christ. Let me show you another passage of Scripture. In Luke chapter, or 1 Corinthians chapter 9, the Apostle Paul is talking about his desire to win people to Jesus Christ. And he talks about how he's going to become all things to all men so that he might win some. And in verse 24, we read this. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow at my body and make it my slave so that, I, so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified from the prize. Paul is saying, I'm going to do everything that I can to be the best that I can so that I might win as many as I can to faith in Jesus Christ. Now, there's a man with great ambition. So contentment does not mean a lack of ambition. You can have great ambition. You may want to change things. You might want to move the world, but still be content in the process. And contentment is not laziness. There are some people that will sit back and go, oh, well, I'm too tired to change the situation, which means I'm too lazy to change the situation. God never, never supports laziness. Just listen to uh, Proverbs chapter 24. It says, I went past the field of a sluggard, past the vineyard of someone who has no sense, Thorns had come up everywhere, the ground was covered with weeds, and the stone wall was in ruins. I applied my heart to what I observed and learned a lesson from what I saw, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come on you like a thief and scarcity like an armed man. The Bible never applauds laziness. And contentment is not being lazy. So what is biblical contentment? Here's my definition of biblical contentment. And we're going to develop it, okay? It is coping with what is and accepting what can't be changed. It's coping with what is and accepting what can't be changed. So Paul sits back and says, I can cope with being well-fed or hungry. I can cope with having poverty and having plenty. I can cope with being free or being chained to a guard. Some of these things I can change. Some of the things I can't. And when I find circumstances that I can't change, then I'm going to accept it. Like Jesus accepted the cup, he couldn't change it. Like Paul accepted the thorn in the flesh, he couldn't change it. Now the word contentment is made up of two Greek words. And one word means sufficient. The other word means independent of circumstances. So Paul says, I've learned to be content in whatever circumstance I'm in. The circumstances do not determine my contentment. What God provides for me in any circumstance is sufficient. Whether I have plenty or I have nothing, 
whether or not I'm well fed or I'm hungry or I'm sick or I'm healthy, whatever the situation is, God provides what is sufficient. Now, he said it's also learned. If you search for contentment, you're never going to find it. It's sort of like chasing bubbles. As soon as you grab it, it pops. My neighbor uh, has three little kids, and a few weeks ago they had this great big tray, and they had this great big uh, bubble maker. They dipped it in the bubbles, and they blow it like this, and bubbles were going all over the room, all over the air in the backyard, and they're running around trying to catch it. Every time they put that bubble in their hand, pop, pop, pop. You can't search for contentment. The minute you think you have found it, it's going to pop. But here's your secret. Colossians chapter 3, verse 17. I want you to look at it. It's in your notes. Listen to what Paul says. Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Now, wherever I am, whatever I do, whenever I do it, I got to do it all in the name of Jesus. Now, we got to explain that. You know, when you pray, a lot of times you end your prayer, in Jesus' name, amen. That is not a magical phrase that gets God's attention That makes God go, oh, they're talking to me. Oh, it's in Jesus' name. I've got to answer that. That is not what it means when you end your prayer in Jesus' name. What it means is this. You're saying to God, God, I've just poured my heart out before you. And I believe if Jesus was sitting right here with me, he would have prayed that same prayer. This is what Jesus wants me to pray about. Okay? This prayer represents what Jesus would have asked for. So take that and think about living in Jesus' name. If everything I do, whenever I do it, wherever I do it, needs to be done in the name of Jesus, it is saying to us, when I do anything, I do it so that I represent Jesus well. I can actually say... This is what I'm doing, and I believe God looks down at what I'm doing and is well pleased with my attitude, with my actions. I have done the best I can to honor Jesus. So when you do something in the name of Jesus, you're doing it the best you can. Wherever, whenever, whatever you do, I want to represent Jesus well. You know, life has a lot of assignments. Some of those assignments are sent directly by God. Some of those assignments are permitted by God. But they are assignments. And when you have the opportunity, I should say it this way, and those assignments give you the opportunity to represent Jesus well. And when you represent him well, you will have contentment. Even in a situation that can still be changed. For instance, you're struggling in your health. And you sit back and you say, God, I want to represent you well in the midst of this health issue, help me represent you well. And I'll give you an example, and I used it without permission. Uh, Becky Huntoon went into the hospital to deal with cancer, had to have a lot of cancer treatments, a lot of radiation, and her whole goal in going to see the doctors was when she walked into that room where there were other people that she would be a representative of Jesus Christ. And she would be, have an opportunity to talk to people and to pray with people and encourage people. That's saying, okay, God, 
This is something I don't like. I don't like having cancer. I don't like going through these treatments. I don't like these rides here. But I'm going to represent you well. That gives you contentment. Maybe you're struggling with your finances. They're out of whack. God, I just discovered my finances are falling apart, and I've got to do something about it, and I've got to change it. So as I'm changing it, I want you to help me, help me represent you well, which probably means don't go out and get another loan to pay off your bills, okay? But I just want to represent Christ well. Maybe you have a relationship that is falling apart, and you don't know how to deal with it. So you say to God, God, this relationship is falling apart. I don't know how to deal with it. But in the process of dealing with it, help me represent you well. And when you begin to represent God well, he gives you contentment, even in situations that need to be changed. But I want you to understand something. This is a daily request. It's not, Lord, help me to represent you well forever in this situation is help me represent you well today. Today. And then tomorrow you wake up and say, help me represent you well today. It's an ongoing thing. And God promises you that he will give you the strength to do anything he wants you to do. So if you want to represent him well, he'll give you the strength to do it. Paul, as an example, he's in prison. He's chained to a Roman guard for 20 four hours a day. He has no freedom. He says to God, God, I want to represent you well. And all of a sudden, it dawns on him. He is chained by two, some of the most elite Roman soldiers in all of Caesar's house. They're called the Praetorian Guard. They're the ones that guard Caesar's house, guard Caesar's family. They're the elite group of soldiers. And it dawns on him, you know, if I talk to them about Jesus, they can't leave. They're chained to me. So he invites them into all of his conversations. And I don't know how he did it. But when somebody would come and visit Paul, they talk about the things of God, that Roman soldier would hear about it. Sometimes Paul would sit back and say, would you like to know more about what I just said? But these Roman guards were coming to faith in Jesus Christ. They were going back into Caesar's household, talking to the other Roman guards, talking to Caesar's family, and many of the Roman guards were giving their life to Jesus Christ because Paul was representing Jesus well in that situation which Paul would have liked to have changed. He's very content. You say, well, how do you know these people were getting saved? Well, listen. Philippians 1, 2 to 12 to 14. Now I know you, I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known through the whole praetorian guard and to everyone else. Otherwise, the gospel of Jesus Christ is making its inroad into the lives of these Roman soldiers. Fantastic. Paul was saying, I'm going to cope with my imprisonment by representing Jesus the best that I can today. And that enabled him to be content. Now, I want to give you a warning. Coping in excellent situations brings its own problem. When we are blessed, it's possible that we would think that we earned that blessing. And that's not good. We don't earn blessings. And if you think you earned a blessing, it can lead to pride, and God hates pride. So even in blessings, even in great times, we need to sit back and say, God, I want you to show me how I can represent you well in these great times today. And God will give you the strength in every situation, whether or not it's a bad situation or a good thing, to represent him. Now, 
Why is contentment so elusive? Well, being, first of all, it's our human nature. If you are a son or a daughter of Adam, and we all are the first Adam, we inherited a human nature that is bent on comparison and on greed. And you can't help but compare things. You can't. There are so many things that I never needed until you got them. You know, you can't help but compare. Athletes get these huge contracts, and they're happy as all get out until somebody gets a bigger contract, and then they want to renegotiate. Comparison is a game you can never, ever win. Contentment can't, can never be found in pursuing something or someone or perfect job or the perfect man or the perfect woman or the perfect marriage because as soon as you think you found it, there's something better. Contentment is not found in the pursuit of things. Greed. The more I feed it, the more I want. The more I feed my greed, the more I want. Ecclesiastes 5.10 says this, He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves abundance with its income. It too is vanity. Now listen carefully. Some of us have some very nice things. And having nice things is perfectly okay. But needing nice things is not okay. Understand the difference? That's why generosity and moderation are so important. Before I talk about generosity and moderation, let me remind you of this. Don't let anybody but God tell you how generous you ought to be or how moderate you ought to be. It's between you and God, how generous you are and how much you live in moderation, okay? Remember that, okay? God says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be. So generosity is very important because it turns my heart toward godly things. Moderation is important. Because moderation allows me to live below what I'm able to live. Moderation, therefore, starves greed. So you conquer greed by generosity and by moderation. It's hard to find contentment because of the American culture that we live in. We live in a consumer-driven culture. I didn't need one until you got it. You know, just think about how many things you have that you saw somebody else have, and now all of a sudden you need it. Every advertisement on television says you need this. Every advertisement. You need this, whether or not it's medicine or a new car. You need it, and you need it how soon? Immediately. Now, I don't want you to gripe about our culture. Just realize it. Enjoying life is good. But don't get swept up in the hype that you got to have everything they advertise. Another reason contentment's hard to get is unrealistic dreams and goals. We live in a culture that believes that there are some ideals out there. There's the ideal man, the ideal woman, the ideal job, the ideal marriage, the ideal bank account, and as you think you finally found contentment because you found the ideal, and then all of a sudden, there's something better out there. And you gotta go after that. You can't find contentment by chasing after the ideal. The other thing is, we live in a culture of encouragement. 
And it's not a good thing. I think encouraging people is good, but the culture of encouragement is something like this. Everybody gets a happy face. Okay, everybody gets a sticker with a star on it. There were eight teams that went to play in that tournament, and your team placed eighth, but here's a trophy that's as big as I am. You know, how many people played in this? Eight teams. What place did you come in? Eighth. Nice trophy. You know, that's a little ridiculous. Some people believe that the worst thing you could ever do to someone is to tell them the truth if the truth would discourage them. We live in a culture that encouragement trumps truth. Many people are discontent because they heard some encouraging words that weren't true, and they've been trying to live that out, and they can't, and they feel like absolute failures. You know, I had a friend that I discipled for two years when I was running my painting business. We got together on a weekly basis, and we went over the Word, and we studied the Word, and we started Bible study together, and he was really growing in his faith. And one day he said to me, he said, Dave, he says, I really feel that God wants me to be a pastor. What do you think? And I was silent. I could have said, go for it, man. God wants you to be a pastor. Be a pastor. You make a great pastor. No, he wouldn't have. And so I looked at him and I said, don't be a pastor. Please don't be a pastor. You'd make a terrible pastor. You don't have a pastor's heart. And there were reasons for it. And he looked at me and he said, well, that's not what I expected. And I said, but I told you the truth. He was an insurance salesman. He was a great insurance salesman. So he quit the insurance business and he went off to seminary to be a pastor. And half a year into seminary, he quit being a pastor or quit being a seminary student. Came back home and started selling insurance. He was never going to make a good pastor. Tell people the truth. You know, don't go up to somebody and uh, lie to them. Oh, you did such a good job. You know, don't do that. Now, you don't have to go up to them and say, that was a really horrible job you did. Okay? You say, where in the Bible does it say something like that? Romans chapter 12, verse 3. For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think. And to think so as to have sound judgment. You know, don't think more highly of yourself than you should. Now, the last reason why contentment is hard to find is because there are poison people and places. There are certain people and certain places that are poisons to your soul. You know them. <laughs> you know what they are. They will always remove your contentment for a moment or for a week or a month. I'm going to tell you what you need to do with those. You need to avoid them if you can. Now, if your poisoned person is your spouse, you can't avoid them. Okay, this is one of the situations you can't change. So you go to God and you say, God, you know how I feel. I'm going to ask you to help me represent you best in this situation today. Okay, now let's tie it together. How do you keep it? Number one, change what you can, accept what you can't. If you can change it, Give it your best shot. Pray about it. Work on it. Change it if you can. If you find out it's out of your control, accept it. 
But in both situations, whether or not you can change something or you can't change something, ask God and say, how can I represent Jesus best today in this circumstance? And if you do, you're going to have contentment. Second of all, avoid contentment killers. I had a Christian man who worked with me when I was a painting contractor, and we did a lot of high painting in high-end houses, a million dollars and up. And he came to me, and he said, I can't work with you anymore. i got to quit. And I said, why? And he said, I work in these expensive houses, and all I think about is I'm never going to have anything like this. And I get discouraged, and I get depressed. And I go home and I just sit on the couch and I'm depressed all night knowing i got to go back into that house the next day and look at all the things I'm never going to have. And I said, well, you don't have to quit. I'll just put you in houses that aren't expensive houses anymore. But I didn't want him struggling with his greed and I didn't want him struggling with comparison and so I just did it for him. Now, I want you to remember, I said, the point says avoid your contentment killer. It's your contentment killer. Your contentment killer is not somebody else's contentment killer. So don't expect everybody else to run away from the things that you run away from. They don't have to because they don't feel the same way. They don't respond the same way to those things. And the last one is this. Treat every situation as a special assignment from God. Whatever the circumstance, say this is an assignment from God and say, I'm going to do my best. God, how can I bring you glory today in this assignment? Don't ask about next week. Don't ask about next month. It's simply asking today for this 24-hour period, how can I represent Jesus best in this assignment? And when you finally get to the place where you're doing this on a consistent basis, you'll be able to say to other people, I have learned the secret of coping with any circumstance. I'm plugged into Jesus Christ. Whatever the assignment, he gives me the strength to be content because I'm representing him well. I want us to go to prayer. I'm going to ask the praise team to come up so that we can conclude with a song. And just want to remind you that after church, after we're done, if you have anything you need to pray about, any special need, anything, there's some prayer teams that will be up front ready to pray with you. Let's pray together. Father, um, contentment is something that you really want us to experience. And Lord, when we begin to put into practice what we talked about this morning, no matter what circumstance we find ourselves in, whether something we can change or something that we can't change, we need to say to you, Lord, How can I represent Jesus best today in this circumstance? And as we do that, the contentment is going to come and we will learn it. It will just be like an aha experience. I get it. I understand it. I'm content. And we'll know, Father, when we walk away from that contentment because we're not representing you well. And then we'll rush right back to saying, I want to represent you well. How can I do it? So, Lord, use this to teach us, to ask you to help us represent you well today in whatever circumstance we face. Because you're the one who is sufficient to meet all of our needs. Thank you, Lord. And this we pray in Christ's name. Amen.